Okay, I think we are just about ready. Let me test. Up, oh, we're looking good. How are we looking over there, Amber? We're ready to go. All right. Hi, this is Tim and welcome to Talks with Tim Live. Today we are going to be doing really instead of a typical deep dive into a certain subject, we're going to do just hitting the basics of Allen Bradley PLCs. And the stumbling blocks that I see happen very often when you're starting out. We, um, you know, we, we do videos on how to do a particular thing. And then usually I say, okay, let's download this and see how it works. And I tell you, if you need any help downloading or any of that, go look at our lesson section and you can find lessons on all of it. So I kind of always skip over this. And a lot of you asked if I would just slow down and go through this part. So I do have the chat open and feel free to ask any questions because I kind of have the, I have a general outline based off of the things I run into when I go to try to connect to a machine. But any questions you have, you'll be able to steer this one really easily. But yeah, let's look in the chat here. Yeah, Kadeep, uh, welcome. And Daryl Johnson, glad you could make, I'm sorry, Daryl Jordan, glad you could make it on. Uh, yeah, hey, thanks for joining us from Venezuela. And yeah, hi. And Jeff Kuiper. Yeah, Jeff Kuiper has been like, fighting the Alaskan wilderness to some craziness. I don't know exactly what he's doing there. Maybe he can fill us in, but yeah. First thing you, when you walk up onto a machine is, you know, you hear it has an Allen Bradley PLC. Well, there are numerous different Allen Bradley PLCs. And even today, I'm not gonna go into a full list. These are the things you're gonna run into often. So one I do have set up here, a Micrologix PLC. And this could be a Micrologix 1000, a Micrologix 1100 a Micrologix 1200, 1400, or 1500. But in general, we call this the Micrologix line. And then I have a Compact Logix PLC set up. And this could also be, this is right along with the Control Logix. And then I have a Micro 800 PLC here, which is kind of the, I'll say the low end modern PLC. And we'll go through more of those in a little bit. And then also, we've got some older ones. You're going to run into plenty of these. This is a Slick 500 PLC right here. So what we're going to do today is talk about, okay, we know what we have here. How do we figure out what software do we need? What cables do we need? How do we configure all these crazy drivers that people talk about? What is upload and what is download? How can we remember it? We're just going to kind of talk through those. Let's see. Let's just go ahead and, well, one, let's look at the softwares we have. See, Jeff Kuiper, is that a safety IO block on the table? Where are you at, Jeff? I gotta think about the table. Yep, you're gonna give me more details, Jeff. I have a Yamaha robot, I have a control panel for Micro 8, uh, Micro 820, and then yeah, I got an 820 back there. Now, yeah, Jeff, I'm not exactly sure. You know, Amber, yeah, Jose, uh, Amber and I were just talking the other day about whether we should go to Houston. We haven't really decided yet. Red next to my arm. No, this is our what we call our Monday morning connector. And so this allows us to have just some quick I.O. on our Compact Logic so that we can talk about some things. In, in our PLC training class, we do teach wiring, but... 15 minutes into the class, you're going to be programming. So we have this just so you can kind of get warmed up. Everything still looking good over there, Amber? Yes, this is made by our kids. And yeah, for a small fee, they might would make them for you. But yeah, these are very difficult to find. So we had to make them. And yeah, this is Amber's first time kind of running the back um, end of the live stream. So I'm very grateful for her being here. Michael has been doing it, but we decided that school probably had to come before the live stream. So <laughs> that uh, Amber is taking over that. But let's have a look at some of the softwares that you'll see. As first, this is what we call Studio 5000. It's for the Control Logics and Compact Logics PLC. And this software, and hopefully nobody gets too offended by me saying this, but it's had an identity crisis for the last decade. This is what a lot of you consider RS Logics 5000. 
And then even if we look in the top here, it says Logix Designer. But if I go to my start menu here and I type Logix Designer, then you're going to see we'll get a compare thing, but we don't even get Logix Designer to come up. And that's because this is the Studio, oops, Studio 5000. This is that software. So we're going to use this for our Control Logix and Compact Logix PLC. And then we have Connected Components Workbench for the Micro 800. And also I went ahead and removed my activation so I could actually use this just like the free version because I believe this is a great entry level um, method of getting into Allen Bradley PLCs and starting to understand them. And then I also have RS Logics 500. And this is what you would use for your MicroLogix PLCs and your Slick 500 PLCs. So we'll call this kind of our legacy software. But after that, we need a cable to connect to it because in the case of the Slick 504, I'm sorry, this is, yeah, this is a Slick 503. And this is the one that really famously can really um, hurt you is this looks like an ethernet port right here. But this is not an ethernet port. This is a 485 port that happens to use the same connector as ethernet. And then we have this bottom one here. And so for that top port, we would use this 1747 UIC. That's too many hands, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this out of my hand. But it has a connector on it that looks just like ethernet but it's not. And this is not just a connector. This is actually a protocol converter also. So this is going to, um, this uses DH485 protocol. And typically the RS-232 is gonna be DF1. So that takes care of that port. But then on that slick and also say on this MicroLogix, we have this nine pin connector here. And that is what we typically would call a serial port. And so people are like, well, I need a serial cable. Well, there are a, I don't even know how many combinations of serial cables are out there, but there are numerous cables that you can call a serial cable, but they have different pinouts. And two examples of those are gonna be, good grief, I just had all these laid out in RE. You know how it is with cables? You lay them out, they're gonna end up somehow tangling themselves. Oh my goodness. Amber's over here laughing at me. She sees me struggling. She's like, ha ha. There we go, finally. But if you look at these two cables, well, aside from the color code, which kind of helps me remember which one's which, this is a, one of these is a 2711NC13. The other is a 1747 CP3. But if you look at them, they're identical cables, but they won't work. So I can plug the NC13 cable into this Micro Logix 1400, and I can try to go online all day. It's not going to work. The CP3 is going to plug in exactly the same, and it will work. So you've got to know which cable you need. And we go have the right cable now. And really, one of the keys to understanding how to, um, to know, or really knowing which cable is, you know, ask them whoever you're buying the cable from. So if you will buy your cables from a reputable place, then you will probably get some help connecting. And we do, we have instructions and actually they work with all of our competitors' cables too. So if you bought a competitor's cable, you probably can use it. But, uh, oh, let me catch up on chat a little bit. Yeah, I got Jeff there. Let's see. What makes an Allen Bradley better than another PLC? Uh, that's kind of like asking which um, automotive manufacturer makes a better car. Uh, it's it's a lot of preference there. Great to see you there, Dave Griffith. And also, um, we did have a few people last time ask. They said they couldn't find the chat window. So if you went with the links, you're probably on this screen right here. Well, actually, I haven't even clicked in. But uh, so you're probably on a screen that looks like this. And if you will just look down, you've got this YouTube icon right here. And if you'll click it, that's going to take you to the actual live stream. Because, you know, if you remember the power of failure incident, uh, we had to change up really fast. So this link right here, I can just change which streams in it. 
But here, once you get here, you're going to have the chat over here. And while you're here, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. If you notice there's a TW in the bottom right corner, if you'll just click on it, you'll see the subscribe here. And yeah, hit that like button on this video while you're there. That really helps us out. But okay, first let's talk about connecting our 1747 or our serial cable. And we're going to do that with this Micrologix. And it actually would be very similar. Now, a lot of people will say, well, that's an older cable. Well, yeah, it kind of is. But there's a lot of times that we need to connect over something like serial. So this is a Micro 850 PLC. It's a modern PLC. And you'll notice it's got a serial cable. Now it has the round connector. And that round one is going to be our 1747, I'm sorry, our 1761 CDL PMO2. That's going to be the round one. You're going to find it on a lot of your Micrologix PLCs. And you'll also find it on many of your modern PLCs. But okay, let's go with the 1747 CP3. And I'm going to plug it into the 1400. And this is a USB version of it. So I'm just going to plug it into my laptop. And then we should hear a little bit of a noise there. And let me get over to my screen. And okay, we have a COM, ca COM port cable here. Now, one thing, if you actually go in, and let's talk about communication software, because actually none of these three are what you communicate with a PLC with. There's actually two communication softwares. And so we have Factory Talk Links. So just start typing Factory Talk, and you'll get it come up here. Factory Talk Links Network Browser. So this is a newer software that Rockwell has come out with. And I, I like a lot of things about it. Um, I'm getting used to a few things about it. But this will allow you to really connect to most modern PLCs with almost no effort. So while it's opening up, I'm going to open up the second one, and that's RS Links Classic. This is what a lot of people are more familiar with. So RS Links Classic. And the difference really is while they've made this super simple, they haven't included the older drivers. So if I go to the configure drivers on this one, available driver types, you only see Ethernet. So that's kind of what this is made for, is it's made for Ethernet and it also has USB right there. Whereas if our, in RS Links, if we go to communications and configure drivers, which is its a, you know equivalent, and we have a gazillion, well not a gazillion, yeah, I gotta admit, there's only like 12 there, but there's a bunch of them here. And honestly, there are a few here that I have never used, but um, but I, I assume they existed at one time. So this uh, this has a lot of old school ways of connecting. But all right, we're going to be using RS two thirty two DF one serial. So that's this one right here. It's not going to work in Factory Talk, and we are going to add a new. And you know, I usually say that you want to name something, but this may be the one time that leaving the name at the default can be super helpful because when you get a file from somebody, it's going to have the link in it. And we'll go further into that later. But so it'll kind of tell you, okay, well, I needed a serial cable. And you can almost figure out which cable you need if you have an offline copy sometimes. But all right, so here's what we come up with. And it's going to default to COM1. And back when computers had laptops, COM1 was that 9-pin one. Well, if you're using a USB one, I will say 99.999% of the time it's not going to be COM1, which is our first obstacle we have to get over. And to do that, we're going to go to our device manager. And this is actually a Windows um, control panel item. So this isn't a Rockwell item, but if we open it up, then we're going to go down through here and we're going to find COM and LPT ports. Now, if you don't have this here, then you do not have your COM port configured correctly. And I'm not going to go through that in this video because that really does vary by which cable you purchase. But I do have videos on our cables and you can find it. But once we get there, we see that this is COM3. So that is what the 1747 CP3 cable is going to be configured, communicating over. So I'm going to select that. And then we supposedly have all this craziness to select and we have this bald right and all these things that, yeah, one time everybody knew about, but now we don't know. 
but we have this magical auto configure button. And so what I'm going to do is click it and bam, auto configuration successful. That easy, it went through and it figured out, okay, this is a micro PLC. And it also, while it ended up being the default, it will go through and figure out each, or it'll try each combination of everything here until it works. So just to show what it would look like, I'm going to unplug the cable out of the Micrologix PLC. And then we're going to go back in and hit the auto configure again. And you can see it zips through a lot of them really fast, but then it's going to slow down here because it's like, okay, let me try some of these older communications combinations. And it's never going to get anywhere, but let's go ahead and let this time out. All right, it says failed to find volume parity, check all cables and switch settings. And if you get this, I will say that, well, you, you have a 50-50 actually. Either you selected the wrong COM port, go back to the device manager and make sure that you got the right one. And one, if you're not sure, let's say you had multiple COM ports, unplug the cable, the, the US, now this only works for USB. Unplug the USB cable and see which one disappears and then plug it back in and that COM port will come back. Other than that, you have the wrong cable. And usually it means you have a 2711 NC13 cable, uh, which looks just like this, but is for panel view. So we're gonna plug that back in and then we will hit our auto configure button again and it's successful. And then we're gonna close this. And then instead of going right on to our PLC software, we can go to communications and RS who, and here we can see which PLCs are actually out there. Now, for the most part, I'll say, and here's one thing that kind of irritates me is by default, the only thing that's there is this RS Lynx gateway. If you notice, we configured drivers. I only added this one right here. That gateway's not there. Gateway's almost gonna do you no good when you're trying to communicate with PLCs. So if you see it, just don't even click on it. So we're gonna click on this ABDF1, and there you go. Now we have a Micrologix 1400. And pay attention to this. Well, let's wait on that. So this is the processor name. So we know we have a Micrologix 1400 and its processor name is First Pro. And now we need to know what software to connect to. And we already have three open here. We have Logix Designer, we have Connected Components, and we have RS Logix 500. Well, RS Logix 500, that's the software we're gonna use. But just to show what would happen if we had the wrong one, we're gonna go here. And in Studio 5000, I always say, go to communications and then who active. Now, if you notice, well, as soon as we get this up, oh, wait, I gotta, I gotta cancel this because I didn't talk about one thing, is since we have two softwares here, this is the old RS Links, and this is the new Factory Talk Links, our newer software gives you the option of which one to use. And I'll say, if you're using Ethernet or USB, absolutely use the factory talk links. But right now we're gonna go over serial because let's say we thought this was the right software. So we're gonna select communication software and I'm gonna select RS Links Classic. All right, now I'm gonna to go to communications. And notice we do have go online, upload, and we could have download here. I always like to go to the who active. And the reason for that is, is that I can make sure that I have the right PLC. But all right, we click serial and there is our Micrologix. And it says failed to go online with controller communications timed out, which is gonna sound like we have an issue with our communications. And just for insanity, we would probably do it a couple more times. So we would click here and then maybe we click back here and we're gonna get it again. And I kind of wish they would massage this to say, hey, you've got an old PLC and new software, or hey, this isn't something we talked to. I wish they would do something a little different here. But a lot of people will be like, hey, I keep getting this error. This error means that you have the wrong software. So we're gonna close this out. And then we're gonna go over here to RS Logics 500. And again, while it's changed a little bit, we still have communications. And then we, in this case, it's system communications. And this is gonna give you all your options again. And then we're gonna have our Micrologix 1400. Only this news, this time we didn't get a communications timeout. We have the go online button. So I'm just gonna hit the go online. And then you're gonna end up with this prompt right here. And I'm gonna show you later on. I really, I really appreciate this prompt more than I do in the um, newer softwares. It's first we can cancel. 
we can create a new file. We can upload use file or we can browse. And so what this means is the file that we have open, and of course I started with no file open, doesn't match what it sees here in the processor. And so, well, we can cancel. And yeah, you know, here's one of those times if you're really not sure what going online means, cancel and hit the um, help button. But then we can create a new file. And but with the one here that also we have is browse. And so if we think we have an offline copy of the file, then we could navigate here, find it, and go online. Now, I don't have an offline copy of this file. So we want to hit this upload use file, but it's grayed out. And that's because we need to create a file to do it. So I'm going to create a file. And you see it says uploading processor image. And there you go. Now we are online with it. And that little split second, it did upload. Now we didn't actually talk yet about upload and download. And this is by far the most dangerous thing a new person does is you know we we've got um we've got our spotify we've got all these apps and all these things and you know we're like yeah i'm going to download some music so i can listen to it while i'm offline and so mentally we're always thinking that we need to download something from something else and you know if we want to if we want to upload our music to the cloud then yeah that means we're sending it somewhere well, the the plc world is the opposite so we download a program to the PLC. In other words, we take our program that's on our PC and we overwrite whatever's in the PLC. And there's no undo button to this. We upload our program from the PLC. So if you walk up on a machine and you're like, I don't have a copy of the file, then you need to upload the program. Do not download. And there is a little bit of a warning. Let's go ahead and go through this. So I'm going to go offline with this one. In fact, I haven't even done this in a while in RSLogix 500. I don't use it often now, but all right, we're going to go offline. Yep, we're going to save our changes. And right there looks great. And okay, and even here, well, let's save that. So we'll upload the processor image. And then now we're offline. So I'm going to go to communications and system communication. And yep, we found our PLC and we're going to hit the download button because we think we want to download our program from the PLC. And it kind of says here, downloading program. And it says first pro two. And then it's telling you about the PLC here over this driver. Are you sure you want to proceed with download? Pay attention to this and make sure you know what you want to do. But just in time, you'll learn. Unfortunately, you'll probably learn the hard way is if you download, you're going to overwrite your program. But OK, so that that hits kind of a serial connection there. And that also hits RS Links Gateway. I mean, RS Links Classic a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and unplug that, get it out of my way. And then let's talk about how to connect to, well, let's go for the, um, go for the control logic or the compact logics here, because these actually are going to be the same. There's a little bit of a lingo difference in um, Connected Components Workbench, and I hope they work, they've worked really hard to make them similar, Studio 5000 and Connected Components, and I hope they keep doing that. But let's go ahead and connect to this. And so we are going to connect, well, a couple ways we can connect this. First, if you notice, oops. Lost my cable. Yeah, I threw it. <laughs> you notice right on the front of here, there is a USB port. Actually, there's a USB port on this one and on this one. And this is by far the easiest way to connect. But honestly, I don't do it very often. Usually we're connecting over Ethernet. One, because, you know, with modern safety rules, usually we're not supposed to really be opening cabinets. And usually there'll be an Ethernet port on the side of it. But so this takes a standard USB A to B printer port, and I'm just going to plug it in to the Compact Logix, and I'm going to plug it into my computer. And then, well, even on RS Links, the old school RS Links, did you notice? I think I got that just in time. We actually ended up a USB port here. 
But what I'm going to say is, you know, they're phasing RS links out. I'm going to say if it's something that you can use factory talk links to do, then use factory talk links to do it. And so I'm going to click right here. If we click into the USB here, give it a second. And there's our PLC, 1769L16EERBB1B. Now, that was pretty insanely easy. And so now, again, we got to know what software we're supposed to use. So this is Logic's Designer and Communications Who Acted. Again, I like this way because, like in this case, now we've got a couple PLCs connected. It's like, okay, which one? But all right. Remember, I switched over to RS Links Classic so we could try to connect to the MicroLogics. So our drivers look a little different here. Now we do have the USB, but that is based off of this RS Links. So we're gonna switch communication softwares here. And right here, we're gonna select, and we're gonna go to a factory talk links. And really, I, unless I'm going over serial, I leave mine on factory talk. But notice this warning right here. This is an important warning. It's telling you even here, hey, we don't have everything in factory talk links that you're used to. Really, I wish they'd kind of say go to RS Links if you can't find it, but that's what we're going to do. And now we're going to go to Who Active. And there it is. So we can click on our L16. And okay, so one, and here's one thing. If um, you notice, I have no file open. Notice my download button isn't there. That's a good hint that, hey, we're going to download to the PLC. The only thing I can do right now is upload, go online, or I could update firmware. And I kind of wish they would hide that button a little bit more, but um, they didn't. So really, here's where you want to be at is in these three buttons. So if you have a file or, you know, you think you have the right file, go open it and try to go online. In this case, I don't have a file, so I'm gonna have to open, or it could go online. In fact, let's go ahead and hit the go online button. Warren, you hey, Warren, welcome to the live stream. And yeah, if you're in the chat, go ahead and you can say hi. You can ask any questions that we're gonna get. We're gonna hit ethernet next. I mean, but yeah, if, if there was a question on that serial, you're like, I'm not sure, or you know, something about the cables. I kind of glazed over the 1747 UIC because, you know, that's that's a very specific connection a lot of times. But, uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. But, all right, I hit the go online and end up with this dialog box here. And it says connect to controller. An offline project is grayed out because I had no program open. And the only option I have is select file. And so I hit the select file button and then, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go try to find a file, and I don't know. Let's let's click let's click device net spelled wrong, but all right, maybe I think that's the file. It's gonna open that file, and notice we end up back here again. Now this is important though, right here is here's where I think Studio Five Thousand gets dangerous and really needs some work is we're trying to go online with this PLC and we thought this device net file was the right file. The only button we have really easily accessible now is this download button. And I mean, I don't, you know, you're, by the time you exhaust all your options, you're going to gravitate towards this download button. And I'm going to go ahead and hit it. I'm not going to proceed, but we're going to hit the download button because this says download offline project device net to controller. That's a pretty good key that we're getting ready to write something to the controller. So yeah, I know there's a lot of words on this on warning here, but if there's ever anything you need to read, try to read wherever it says download or upload and understand it. But okay, there's a few other hints here that can help us out is first our controller names and if you've watched many of my videos you know i tell you make your vi make your video names yeah make your video names memorable that way people will find them on youtube but um find make your controller names memorable so this one named device net if this was actually on a machine is a horrible name now this is part of a device net video series i was doing so it was probably an okay name but mainly first, if this name doesn't na match this name, then you do not have the right PLC. Also right here, these serial numbers. Every serial number is unique. So if these two numbers don't match, 
then you're not going to be able to down, you're not going to be able to go online. But you definitely have the wrong file. But here's where the problem comes in is maybe we kind of vaguely know that we need to upload. There's no upload button right here. There's only a download button. And I really wish they would just take this button off of here or put the upload button in its place. I don't know. You know, this wasn't an issue in RS Logix 500. And I think this button has caused a lot of grief with some people. But all right, so we had selected a file and we can't find the right file. Well, if we actually look up here on this dialog box, it says enter new or select existing file. And so I see people all the time, you know, when they're when they're here getting training, they will exhaust every file in here and finally be like, well, I can't find the file. I guess I need to download the program from the PLC. And it's like, nope, you uh, don't want to do that. Let's see, we got a question there. Please explain tag type like base and alias. Yeah, um, Amber, can you make a note of that? I will get that as soon as we get through um, Ethernet. But okay, right here, this select file. If we'll just enter a file name that doesn't exist, then it will upload. So I'm just gonna, while it says Monday blank, and notice I have a Monday blank here, I'm just gonna make a Monday blank one. And I'll select that. And now you're gonna see it's gonna crunch for a while because it's gonna create that program. All right, it's asking if I wanna create this and upload the file now. And there you go. Now we have our program, which yes, this is called Monday Blank because it is a blank program that we're going to work with here in a little bit. And all right. So that's that's the basics of the USB connection. So again, by far, USB is the easiest one. Now, it has a lot of limitations, though. Uh, one, you really need to plug directly into it. And yeah, I know they make those little ports that have USB on them. But USB is really good for like, I think six feet. Does anybody in chat know? Isn't USB good for six feet? It's something insanely short. So you're not going to be able to use it very far away from the machine. So usually you are going to be over Ethernet. So I'm going to go ahead and go offline here. And we're going to take that USB out. And we're going to talk about Ethernet because Ethernet is one of those that if it is perfectly set up, then it's going to work great. But if it's not, then it doesn't. So in fact, let's just go ahead and let me um, let me change a few things. Let's see. While I'm doing that, how's everything looking over there, Amber? Car ran real good. Car ran real good. That's a, yeah. If you if you haven't watched Talladega Nights, that's that's usually our thing for yeah. We don't really know what to say, but um, everything seems fine. So, I am going to go in here. Yep. Now we're going to go right out. I'm just, I should have changed this before the live stream started. But I'm going to put everything at the default like you would have your laptop when you walk up to a machine. All right. So we're ready. So we have Ethernet, and I am plugged in right here on this port directly there. And what we would love to do now is go to Factory Talk Links and click on Ethernet. Go ahead and close that USB up. But we'd love to click right here and get our PLC to show up. But that's not going to work because we don't have our Ethernet on our PC configured to communicate with these machines. And one big hint you'll get of that is if you see this 169.250 Four number. If you see anything that looks like that, that means that DHCP is enabled on your PC. So it's waiting on a server, and that's more of something you would have in an office environment. In in our, you know, when we're walking out and we're plugging directly in the machine, we're not going to have a DHCP server. So we're going to need to know what our IP address is. Let's see, and Amber says I have a question I need to ask. Answer. Let's see. Matthew, if you don't mind, what is the best practice for working with RS Logix 500 project files? I know comments, descriptions, etc., are not stored, 
with the program or controller. And, you know, and this is an important one that probably deserves its own video. But, you know, everybody has their own method on this. But I, I stress to companies all the time, you, you when you buy a piece of equipment, you need to get an offline copy of the PLC program. And that never seems like a big deal to anybody. And I gotta admit, it's it's a little sweeter now because the Compact Logics or most of your more modern ones, they do store descriptions. But your older PLCs didn't. Yeah, so you would end up with um, just total gibberish, really, of a bunch of addresses, no descriptions, no actual, you know, names of anything. So when you get a machine in, upload the program, save it somewhere, save it as something memorable. That way you can find it later. And really do not trust your vendor. I don't care how much, I don't care if TW Controls built that machine for you. Don't trust them to have given you the right program. Get somebody to go out there and go online and upload that program and match it up with those descriptions. And, you know, and then the next thing I hear is, oh, well, we don't have the software. Well, pay a competitor to come in. I mean, that's small insurance that is going to pay off, you know, five, ten years down the road when it's broke. So, yeah, that's, that's all I can preach, Matthew, on that is, yeah, make sure that you have described comments. And also, you know, when, when we're not on fire with a machine down, if you do have program or machines that are not documented, that's a great thing to put your entry level techs on. You know, don't put them sweeping the floor or counting nuts and bolts. Put them out there and say, hey, start figuring out how this machine works. Start trying to, you know, put descriptions on the inputs to put descriptions on the outputs. Figure out what tags in this HMI go to what over here and have them start back figuring how that program works. It'll that'll be a great training for them. But all right, where were we? Oh, yeah, we were on DHCP. So right now, we have DHCP enabled. And that means we can't communicate with any of our PLCs. And so we're going to go and change our um, IP configuration. And this has changed many ways, and I know there's faster ways. But the most predictable way from really, I think, Windows 95 until, I assume Windows 11. I haven't seen Windows 11 yet, is just to go to your control panel and select control panel, and then find network and internet. And then we wanna to go to our network and sharing center. And then on the right, you're gonna see change adapter settings. All right, and in this case, I, I have this stripped down. This is kind of the same PC we use at the, um, at the um, our training is, we only have one ethernet. But we could have multiple ones. In fact, let me open up this one, just so we can see what we could be trying to navigate. And so in this case, you usually will have multiple adapters. So we have a Wi-Fi, and you know, your Wi-Fi is gonna probably be on, you know, even though it probably will, you typically won't connect over it. We have a Bluetooth connection. And in this case, we have a virtual box because that's what you're actually seeing here is a virtual machine. And then we have ethernet. And usually yours is gonna be called ethernet or wired or LAN. But one thing you can always do, and actually I don't have it where I can reach it easy, is you can unplug what you think is the one going to the machine. And all of a sudden it's gonna have an X on it just like this one. So that's one way you can identify definitely which device you're working with. But all right, so we're gonna double click on that. And then we want to find its properties. And that's going to bring us to this craziness right here that has a bunch of things that we don't know what are. But we're going to be looking for something called TCP. And it's either just going to be called TCP IP if it's a really old computer, or in this case, it'll start being called TCP V4. We do have this V6, but we're not really adopting it much yet. So we want to double click on the version 4. And we see we've got obtain IP address automatically. And what that is, is it's looking for somebody to tell it, hey, what IP address do you want me on? Well, we don't know it. And so this is the time that, yeah, you, you really need to keep track of your IP addresses because, you know, even here, the, the first, and that's one thing I love about the Compact Logic Center training classes. You know, we, you know, we get to this point and I'm like, well, what's the IP address? Everybody points at that Mac right away. It says Enet address. 
that's got to be it. Well, no, that's not it. That's a MAC address. It's not going to help us out right now. And yeah, there's nothing here. And yeah, somebody will probably tell me in chat, well, some of them have a display. And you know, this one has a great display right here if I can get it to focus. But this morning I noticed the display buttons have gone out. So even if it has a display, you better have it written down somewhere. So let's go through a wrong way because, all right, we don't know a lot about IP addresses, but we go and we know that we've heard of 192.168.1. So I'm just going to type 192.168. Actually, let's start with zero, just so we can be wrong. This is not right for this network we have. I'm just going to randomly throw 107 in there. Now, here's one cool feature. As you know, you have to have this subnet. If while you're up here, you'll just hit the tab button, it'll fill in the subnet to what it probably needs to be based off of that IP. We're going to click that, though. We're going to hit OK. And we're going to see that, yeah, that's really not going to do us any good. Except for this IP address here. We'll change here in just a little bit, probably. Let's just give it a second. There it goes. It blanks out. Well, and apparently we need to be patient. And you know, while we're being patient, if you haven't already hit that like button on this video and subscribe to go ahead and do that. But yeah, actually, I, you know, and honestly, I, I don't do this often. Well, I shouldn't say I don't do this often wrong. We do have a cool tool that'll help us um, discover the IP addresses. But uh, so yeah, I, I rarely get in this situation, but that may never come back. I'm not really sure. But I do know the IP address of this one. It is 192.168, and then it's gonna be on the one network. And honestly, I don't even know for sure which one is which from there, but let's go back into here and let's change that. Actually, let, let's, do, let's do that a little bit better. Let's say now we call somebody and we're like, oh, they say it's, well, it's 192.168.1.171. We do have a few tools to help us out here. So as old school as it sounds, we're gonna to go to the start menu and let's type command prompt. And that's gonna bring up this ancient looking DOS thing. And this may be the most important thing you understand in um, when you're troubleshooting ethernet. And yeah, I know it looks old, but it's not. So we have a ping command. So the guy on the other end of the phone told us that he thinks it's 192.168.1.171. So I can ping space and then that IP address and I hit enter. Okay. And you know, I don't really care what it says here as much as, you know, if it doesn't say reply from and that IP address that we were trying to ping, then we failed. So then there's another command. It's called IP config. And this is going to give you what your IP configuration is. Now I always tell everybody, I do not do networking classes. But Tim's networking rules say that these first three octets, which are the kind of the groupings of numbers, need to be the same. And this last one whoops, needs to be unique. So right now, 192.168.1 is not the same as 192.168.0. So we're never going to be able to connect between these two. So let's go back to our Ethernet configuration and we're gonna change it. Now you have to be really careful doing this because if you happen to put an IP address in that is already used on a network, you can make devices cease to talk and you can take systems down. So really this is where you've gotta document these IP addresses out. So we're gonna click okay to that. And even before we go back to RS links, one, let's go ahead and hit that IP config so we see the difference. So see now it says 192.168.1.107 and our IP we're going for was 1.171. So now when, I, you know, I quickly did that, I didn't tell you. If you hate typing, if you'll hit the up arrow, it'll give you your last command. And if you hit the up arrow again, it'll give you the command before that. And we can go down so we can scroll through the commands we've entered. And I'm just gonna hit enter there. And all right, now we have a reply. And, you know, mainly we're getting a reply from the IP address that we pinged. And yeah, it says something about some bytes, some times, and some TTLs. And as long as we get that, then we're ready to communicate. So now we're going to go back to factory talk. Oops. 
and click our Ethernet, and bam, just by having our IP address configured on our network, we discovered all these PLCs right here. Oh, Bootstrap Viz advice is on, isn't that? Yeah, well, welcome. Glad you could be here. Yeah, Amber's in the background. She's running the show today. All right, so now we can find our PLC. Now, notice we have multiple ones here. And so here again is where I tell you all the time that you've got to make your PLCs memorable. Because, okay, the guy on the phone told us that it was probably, he thinks it was 171. But, uh, you know, this PLC, at least that icon, looks exactly the same as this PLC icon. And you notice we got some other ones up here that look really similar. So again, you've got to make these things memorable. So was this the Modbus server, server or was this Monday blank? Now, we happen to know we were on it with the USB. If you recall a little bit ago, we plugged in the USB port. So the name that showed up under USB and that we ended up uploading our program with is going to be the same name that it identifies as over Ethernet. So now we know that the one we want is this one right here. Okay, let's go ahead and go back to Studio 5000 and we'll go to Communications. And again, we're gonna use that Who Active. And again, you know, I know those buttons are up there. In fact, let's show again in a second. Oh, well, okay, let's go to Ethernet. Let's just show this for a while before we even go there. We, we want to go online because we have our program right now, right? So I'm going to go to communications and I'm just going to hit the go online because I want to shortcut through this. And this is what happens. And this will happen more if you don't get online every day is you get failed to go online for controller. Communications timed out, you know, and next, oh, well, okay, I guess I need to upload my program. So we upload communications timed out. And again, we... We hope we never have to hit the download button when we're trying to do something, but again, we're going to get communications timed out. And that's why I like to use in communications who active, because it's going to take you through the steps you need to go through instead of it just saying, hey, I can't find this thing, go away. Because now we see same error as before, but now we look here and we're like, oh, well, we're not browsing our PLC. So I can go to Ethernet, and now I can go to... 192, 168, 1161, because that is our Monday blank one. And then I should, if we feel this is the offline program, then I should be able to just go online, even though it's a different path. And looks like it's going online. And there you go. So now we're online. So this is by far the easier way to go online with Ethernet. Now, one thing I didn't talk about there is, you know, we still have our RS Links Classic over here. Is what's the equivalent of this and this? Because this is going to trip you up. In fact, it tripped me up for a while. Is now we just have plain Jane Ethernet. But if we go over here, Communications, Configure Drivers, and our available driver types, we have two here. We have Ethernet Devices and we have Ethernet IP. Well, the default Ethernet settings on Factory Talk Links is going to be this Ethernet IP driver. So I'm going to click Add New to it. And again, here, you know, as much as I say make things memorable, this may be the one time that I usually find people have a little less friction if they leave that default it is this driver name. Then, okay, and then it's going to ask us which one we ought to be able to leave it at Windows default. Close. And now we can open up our Ethernet IP. And there you go. This is the identical as this right here. So that's what those are doing. Now, again, I do not recommend using RS Links as Ethernet drivers anymore. I do recommend the Factory Talk Links just because it's, it's a little more modern. They're developing it still. And I have found that um, it's a little smoother. Now, there is one thing you need to be aware of in the, oops, my cords, is if we look here, is and whoops, where did my screen go? There we go. Is I'm going to unplug the Ethernet out of the um, controller. And again, I can't decide if I really like this feature or if I really dislike this feature. It's a tough decision on this. But if you go back to my screen focus, when I unplug it, 
we should see in both of these this 161 disappear. Or I'm sorry, let's just observe those because one of them's going to disappear, the other's not. So I'm going to unplug it and we'll give it a second. And there you go. You notice over here it disappeared, that PLC dip. Over here we got the red X that we're used to. And this makes factory talk link stay really clean and uncluttered because you know a lot of times I'll go to and somebody bring their PLC and we're working on something and you know they'll have they'll have two hundred PLCs with a red X and they're trying to navigate all this to find the one, but in this case, I do know this was here at one time, and in this case I don't. So I think this is something that just has to grow on me, or maybe there is a way to see the history. I don't really know. Maybe I should look into that a little further, but. That is the big difference to be aware of. So I'm gonna plug both of those back in now. And now you're gonna see the red X go away over here and you're gonna see it reappear over here. So in factory talk links, they disappear when you're not communicating. In ours links classic, they just become a red X. Let's see, Leland, we switched from RS links to factory talk links because it worked better. And you're right, it does. It does seem to be a little bit better at communicating. We started having um, some issues actually um, here at the PLC lab where we would just get to almost a, just a marginal point where, you know, we couldn't, you know, if we added one more PLC to our network, it was like the Achilles heel and all of a sudden, Everybody started, you know, having Studio 5000 operating real slow. PLCs disappearing and reappearing. And we switched to Factory Talk Links, and yeah, that made it much better. But okay, let's go on and talk about the other one, though, because we still have two drivers here. As you notice here, this is the Ethernet IP driver. Now, over here, there was nothing. And so... Let's see, Jose, what's the difference between RS Links? I don't know what that last word is. RS between links and RS links. Is that a misspelling? I don't know what the M O T E T H A N is. See, I don't know that we'll get into restoring an EEPROM in this one. One, I don't have an EEPROM within reach, and I'm not sure I have one here. I would have to ramble through things to find one. I may have, a, I may have an EEPROM for a. For a 5A3 handy. We'll see where we get with that. I'm not sure I have one to um, go to that. We might better actually I could hit it slightly at the end of this, maybe. Or at least see show you where it was. And let's see. Well, welcome, Ender. Very nice to see you from Argentina. But okay. So right here we had another driver. And so what is the difference between our Yeah, I'm not following that one. Okay, but um, if this works awesome if we are plugging directly into a machine or we are on a very basic network like we have here at our training center because everything just plugs into a basic Ethernet switch. But if you are on a more complicated network, if you have a VLAN or if you have a um, VPN or you're doing some any type of remote connection, or you know it has a very traffic intensive network then they are going to block the packets that let this ip discovery work because what happens is really rs links or in this case factory talk links kind of you know sends out and says hey is anybody out there and then everybody here you know all the plc's say hey look at me look at me i'm right here and that's how we discover things on ethernet ip now i know there's more to it than that but i don't teach networking classes so if you go to a more complicated network, they're going to block these packets. And so in that case, we're going to need to use our Ethernet, our, well, in this case, in RS Links' case, it was called the Ethernet Devices Driver. In this case, over here, we're going to need to reconfigure what we're calling our Ethernet Driver. So we're going to hit the um, little wrench there, the driver configuration. And right here on the general screen, we see that we have a discovery method. And that's what the, that's what it's all about. And like, let's go ahead and go over here and let's go to configure drivers. And remember, we had Ethernet devices and Ethernet IP. And really, the main difference, now there are other differences, but from our point of view, the difference here 
is that in the Ethernet devices case, you've got to tell it where to actually scan. Or in this case, device list range is what we're going to use. We're going to have to tell it what IP address it is. So in this one, I'm going to put in 192.168.1.161. And over here, I'm going to put, I'm going to do the same just so you can see how it would work in RS links. So there we go, we're going to click OK, we're going to click OK, whoops, oh yeah, I need to accept the row. Yep, we're going to continue there. Now it did warn us there that, you know, hey, you're going to modify the existing driver. Over here I, I added a second one because I'm not going to use either of these, I'm going to delete them. But now instead of getting all of these magical ones here that we had no idea were even out there, we now have just the 192.168.1.161. And over here we have the same because that's what we entered. Now, you know, I haven't I haven't used this much in Factory Talk Link. So let's see what it looks like when we unplug the cable out of our PLC. So I'm gonna unplug the cable of the Compact Logics. And then let's see what happens here. All right, so we have our traditional red X now in our Ethernet devices driver and RS links. Okay, and hey, it, uh, I do like that. And I don't know, it may just be some time for me to get used to them disappearing, but I do like that because I specified something. I don't want it to disappear. So we definitely have a problem there. Let's see. Yeah, Leland, you're right. Manage switches. We can block those packets out there. And, um, and you know, they do. If you think about it, when you get, you know, three or four hundred devices out there, that would be a lot of excess traffic for not a tremendous reason. I mean, really, because let's face it, a lot of people leave RS links open all the time. So it is, you know, choking, you know, with more traffic. But okay, let's go ahead and just to show, let me plug that back in. And let's make sure it goes back. But yeah, I haven't actually done okay. And that one went back nicely. And yeah, we do know that Ethernet IP will go, or the Ethernet devices will go back. But all right, I'm gonna go ahead and delete these out. Because again, I I don't feel that, you know, since Rockwell has a new software, I don't feel that, you know, they're they're gonna probably do the proper updates on RS Links Classic for Ethernet now. So I am going to delete that. And we're going to delete that. You know, and I didn't really even mention it, but we did um, automatically get this USB one when we plugged that USB port in. I'm going to delete that. We'll leave the serial one up just in case you guys have some questions. And we got people from Brazil. We got people from South Africa. Welcome, everybody. But okay, I'm going to put my Ethernet one back like it was. So we're going to right click it and driver configuration, or you can hit the little wrench here. And we are going to go back to our broadcast because this is going to allow us to do some discovery. So I haven't really looked here. What's under tuning? Okay. I was just curious if there was a quick way to make those not disappear because I think I'll get used to it in time, but still bugging me a little bit that my PLCs disappear instead of having red X's. Um, but yeah, I think that's just something I'll get used to. But all right, we're just about at the end of talking about ways to communicate. We've hit um, USB, we've hit serial, and we've hit Ethernet decently. Or, so if, is there any questions out there in the chat uh, about any of those? If not, we're going to go ahead and hit some of our basic instructions. So I'm going to go ahead and go ahead, you know, even if I move on, I'll bounce back. So if something comes up, oh, how to fix the unrecognized device. That's an excellent one. Man, I need an unrecognized device. Do I have, I mean, uh, I wasn't prepared for that. But wait a second, Amber's gonna keep you entertained while I uh, grab something. Oh, <laughs> uh, Amber, Amber, you're always entertained. I know you can do that. Just me? Yeah, go ahead, sing to them. That'll, um, that'll lower our, our um, bandwidth. I really Yep. Yeah.
Daddy Crew, he's coming back. <laughs> And I don't even know if it's actually going to work. So I did notice this the other day because I, I have a new device to play with. Let's see if it comes on. Okay, and there you go, Juan, or UV. Sorry, hey, Juan from North Carolina. <laughs> hey there, MB Clemens. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I thought she would have jumped over here and like at least entertained instead of being a blank screen. <laughs> But okay, so now, UV, here you go. Here's your unrecognized device. And honestly, here's where, you know, it's always bad to do things on the fly, but I did, I literally just powered this device up yesterday and saw, oh, I need to do something about that. But let's right click it. And okay, we don't get it there. All right, so anchor, refresh, hit the more thing, device property. Used to, there was an, Upload EDS. And man, this may be the first time I've seen something that's not in Factory Talk links that I would really love right now is an anchor refresh. Well, I've been through all this. So used okay, so we have something I'll I'll have to learn how to do that. But okay, I know I just deleted these drivers out. Let's go and add that Ethernet IP driver back in. And we'll browse. Okay, and there's our unrecognized device. Actually, I don't know why the power flex is unrecognized. Okay, that's good. Okay, so I was kind of curious. I was hoping I could come here and do it and it show up over here, but okay. I'm gonna have to figure out how to do that, UV, um, because used to you would right click the device and actually. Well, guys, this is one time that, yeah, I do not have the answer because where is the upload? Okay, so if they have, I think that's what it is. If EDS files are available, right click. There it is. Okay, so if there is an EDS file on the device, then you can upload EDS files. I'm glad that one showed up that way. I'm not sure what's up with that power flux. I'll have to figure out why that one's not. But okay, so typically you'd be able to right click it and find that if it's available. Now, in the case of this Yamaha, um, I think I have to download it. So I would have to go on the internet and download it. So there you go. Um, so there's a quick way though, is just, well, let's go ahead and do it. We'll upload. And I believe it'll get a prompt here in a second. Yeah. And so what it did is it actually went to the PowerFlex, which had its EDS stored. Oh man, Amber, why didn't you tell me I wasn't? I so yeah, guys, y'all gotta tell me quicker here. Um, yeah, cause I can't undo that. Well. Um, well, oh, well, it didn't do it yet. Let me see if I can get it fast enough. All right, it looked like that. <laughs> Let me do a screen capture and we can talk about it. There it goes. I got it. Okay. I got it before it loaded back up. So since I haven't actually browsed, it's still here. So right click the device. Oh, you're still, come on, Amber. You got to help me here. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So when you see these question marks, that means that it is unrecognized. So you can right click them and upload EDS from device. You hope that's there. And if it is, I'm gonna to try to click it again and see if it'll happen again. And because right now it actually already has it installed. Let's try it. Okay, and there you go. And so it downloaded it again. And you're just gonna get next through these. And there you go. So that should be finished. And now if I click up here, Oops, so well, I was thinking now. We should see 162 update now. If not, I'm not sure why. Honestly, I'm not sure why 162 is coming up as unrecognized. I'm gonna probably have to look at that later anyway. But yeah, something's going up with it. But all right, that's what you would do is you would hope that you can upload EDS. Now in the case of this one, it didn't have that option. So we'll have to go on the internet. All the Yamaha, they have an excellent download area. 
you need to go check that out anyway because uh, they have all types of AOIs for their devices. We're doing a video series on some of those right now. But all right. Any other questions on connecting besides that? But yeah, I am going to have to figure out how to do it over here. Okay, but you know something? It probably would be here. Oh, how do I get that out of the way? Oh, well, now we have a learning opportunity for factory talk. Oh, we'll just move that. Okay. Um, oh, there you go. Okay, so if a device has the EDS file available, you'll have that upload EDS. But okay, in the case of this one, it didn't, and so it wasn't available. All right, well, that went semi-smooth. <laughs> what other questions do you have? All right, we're going to go ahead and start a new program here while we're doing that. Oh, we hadn't actually talked about connected components. That's right. Let me, let me hit that at least a little bit before we do. Because what you would love to happen is to have that same communications who active thing. And I really wish they would, but they haven't. So, you know, Rockwell, if you're actually out there, this would be on my wish list is right on every other software we can go to communications and we can manage to like go on act, go go online, upload and download. It would be great to have that there. But we need to go to actually we have to create this right there. It is. We have to go to this discover and discover is really what I would basically call upload almost or it could be browse it's it's kind of a gray area i wish like i said i wish they would make this a little more uniform and okay and it's it's thinking about it right now so yeah while it's thinking about it if you hadn't hit that like button then yeah please like this video and yeah hit that subscribe and yeah any questions you have in chat feel free to put them this, this is you know we're trying to hit those basics Let's see, um, RS Links compatibility with Excel for exporting data. What for the, for that you are going to need a what well, I would allow, and here's where you hate to say you got to pay for you know you have to actually have a paid version of it. Actually, I don't even think I do not. I, I um I don't have a paid version of this. So you would need single node or or professional or something like that, and then you could use um you could use them to do that there's some modern ways we probably should do a video on that sometime um actually you know i've got um since we're here we're going into connected components i have a um a, i've I learned they, they've got some neat things in here now all right let's go to ethernet and this one is a micro 850 and okay there's you know we haven't talked a lot about this you notice we've got a couple of micro plcs here and so after that, it's going to give us the part number. And that's why, you know, you got to identify your machines. And then we're going to use the Micro 850 up here. So we're going to click OK. <laughs> well how i was waiting for it to upload but okay so what it just did and that's why i kind of wish they would call this oh it's still it's still getting it um well, i really think the discover button should be upload uh, but i guess they're trying to get away from those terms so either in studio 5000 they need to get away from those terms or in we need to go to those terms and connect to components. Because that's the one stumbling block I see is really is when you upload, when you download, and what the what the world is that discover button? All right, it's still thinking through it. And there you go. We are now look, even down here it says upload succeeded. So we hit discover, we navigated to it and hit the OK button, and it uploaded. So I call this upload. And now we are online with it. And, you know, it doesn't look that much different. I don't even know what program's in this one, so we'll see. Okay, well, well it is a little different in here. We're doing some, uh, we we're doing some motion control or some things. Yeah, so this, um, but yeah, this the ladder looks about the same. 
the only stumbling block really is well one let me go ahead and just disconnect from here so we can see these is in the end they do call it download and upload but you have that discover also usually i just right click over here and then you have download upload and connect connect is go online so yeah the terminology is still a little bit gray there but yeah <laughs> i'll leave that at that but all right we're going to be working over here in studio 5000 we're just going to run through some basic instructions and yeah any questions that come up while we do feel free to throw them down in the chat but we're going to create a new program so i'm going to go file new and the next thing we need to know is which plc we have and this is a 1769 l16 er bb one b and again i mean i can't stress to you enough make your program files names memorable and your program or your controller names memorable so i am just going to know uh, yeah in this case i this is a live stream oh 9 28 i guess that is kind of what it is and so I'm going to click next. And then for the L16 or the point .io ones, you actually have to tell it how much expansion I.O. it has. And it will fault the controller if you don't. And, yeah, if you want to learn about controller faults, let me know in the chat. And, you know, I'll go ahead and fault this controller and we can see it. But uh, so that is the number of modules to the right of the PLC. So this is our base PLC. And then we have this and this so that is two expansion modules so we're going to put in a two there and we'll hit the finish button all right oops Okay, UV, and we're actually getting really close to your tag type, um, explaining tag types and alias things now, because, all right, so this is the way it comes up when you open it, and the one thing that a lot of people get lost on right away is when we open up, like, RS Logix 500 or something, in fact, let me do that, let's see, was well, this something, yeah, we uploaded this, this is kind of the way it comes up, and it's like, oh, yeah, okay, I can understand this, here's my, um, yeah, here are my instructions, so I just need to start dragging things down. This is this is pretty easy. And we get over here to Studio 5000, and it's like, where's my stuff? And what I always tell everybody is you can kind of follow down task and just keep hitting the arrows into it, and eventually you're going to find the main program. And so this is the program that is going to be ran by default. And so a little just really quick spill about task is we have a continuous task and that thing runs as fast as it can. It's not particularly timely. It's not a high priority even, but it, as soon as it's done running, it goes and tries to run again. And then inside of it, we have programs and mainly inside of it, we have routines and we're only gonna run the main routine. We'll have to use JSRs and things like that to do the others. But all right, so we're gonna bring down, in fact, let's, you know, this is a good idea. Let's do this in both RS Logix 500 and Connected Component, I mean, and Studio 5000 at the same time. So I'm gonna bring down, oh, we already have a wrong down. So over here, what did they even do? Okay, I drug down and examine on, and I drug down and output energize. And so over here, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna drag down and examine on, and I'm gonna drag down and output energize. And the next thing we need to do is we need to find out what addresses we're going to use. So what I'm going to do on this is we do have our Monday morning um, push button station on it. And it has inputs 0 through 7. So you can see here, hopefully you can see the lights. Yeah, you can kind of see them. That's input 0 and yeah, on down through there. And what I'm going to do is make it when we turn on input 0 here, that output 0 turns on on the PLC. So fairly basic, but it will get us through a lot of our tag obstacles. So in this case, actually let's start in 500 because a lot of you are familiar with it. And also even laid out over here, we have outputs, we have inputs, and we got a bunch of other things that maybe we do or don't know about. But if we go into here on our inputs, then this top one right here, I colon zero backslash zero is input zero. And even from here, I can just drag that right there. 
and bam, we're done. And we can do the same thing on the outputs. We can drag output zero right into here, and we're done. So <laughs> really, besides the fact that, yeah, we definitely need descriptions, we're going to verify this project, and it's ready to go. And we're going to add descriptions because the biggest thing I see people do when they start out is they're like, um, I'll remember it. That's input zero. Yeah, that's the top switch. Output zero. Yeah, I got that. But then as our program starts growing, all of a sudden there comes a point where you're like, oh, my brain can't hold anymore. I'm done. And so right away, before we do anything, we're going to add a description of this. And I am going to call this switch one. And then typically I would wire this to light one. Now I did not wire the outputs on this. I probably should have, but, and yeah, if we get really, if we get really in the weeds with something, we might, we might add some wiring to this, but um, we, we did the wiring in a live stream a few times ago, but I'm going to go ahead and call this light one. Just mainly that way I have description on it. UV. What is the difference between Studio 5030 and 32? Uh, you know, I don't know any major differences between them. Obviously, you could look at the um, revision notes and probably figure some of that out. Um, I think there might be a few new processors in 32. That's the biggest thing I can think of. Uh, there also is version 33 out now. Now, I'm not really excited about I mean, I'm downloading the latest version, so we, um, yeah, I probably won't do that. I don't know a lot about it. But okay, let's see. Would a one shot be another means of programming alternately lag pump in the previous video? Didn't I use that one shot? I'm pretty sure I used a one shot. Um, let me just, yeah, let's keep going. We want to open up another version and get that open and we'll, yeah, we can talk about the one shot a little bit. But okay, so over here, it was pretty easy. We were able to figure out, oh yeah, there's our inputs, there's our outputs, drag some things down, we're ready to download. Studio 5000 is a little different because, well one, obviously you don't see your inputs and outputs laid out really well there, but we do see this IO configuration down here. And the trick to this is while the input and output works great, if the IO is right there, when you got into like data highways and all these other networks in 500 and everything, it became nightmarish because you couldn't figure out whether an output was on this PLC or whether it was shooting over device net going here or what was going on. So while it's really complicated to figure out where your first input and your first output are in the compact logics because of the tag addressing, it is insanely easy to look at a tag address and figure out where it is. So let's walk through a little of that. As first we see here, we've got IO, we've got point IO, and that's going to be right on our PLC. And it says embedded. And we're going to have our embedded discrete IO, and it has a one right here. And so what this means, and one thing I do wish they would put somewhere in here, and I don't even know where it would be. I wish they would put identify something here as local. But if you see the word local, then that means that it's going to be physically on our PLC. And so, yeah, let's look at our controller tags and see if we can work that out. So first, all things are in our controller tags. And so we're going to open it up. And we have a local one. And that's all we have right now. And that's because that's all I've configured in this program. So we have C, and that's going to be our configuration. And for this live stream, I think we probably could say that typically you won't need that. And then we have I and we have O. So I is for input, O is for output. Now, one thing we haven't actually addressed is what is an input and what is an output? Because, you know, those are two terms that we kind of throw around like everybody ought to know too. An input is something that we are going to look at, that we're going to read. Like my eyes are looking at something, I'm getting input from this screen. An output is something that we are going to tell something to do. So I hit this key right here, it's going to do something, or we hope it will. So our outputs are going to go to lights, they're going to go to contactors, they're going to go to things that we want to make the machine do things with. And our inputs, we're going to sense things about the machine, its state, its position, things like that. All right, let me catch up a little bit on chat here. 
Let's see. Glad you love our channel. Let's see. We hit version 30 and 32. All right. I'm going to bring the one shot thing up. What is the full 1766? Is it a tag? Oh, Warren, that's actually a great question. That is back here in Studio 5000. Um, this is something they added that really kind of start trying to help us um, navigate some of these craters of <laughs> as we were adding IO. Actually, this is to help us with this whole tag thing. Is 1766, that is this PLC. So if we look at the micro PLC, I, I turned autofocus off. You're not going to be able to read it because it drives me insane where it focused and unfocused. But this is a 1766 L32 BWA. So what that's saying is, hey, this is a 1766 PLC. That's what this I.O. is on. And if I go here and, yeah, let's just add something. Here again, here I go doing it on the fly. I hope this works. And um, we're just going to add a, an IA8 here. That's going to be the second one. Let me grab a drink of water here. All right, so I just put that in slot one. So you notice this zero right here. This is O colon zero slash zero. So that means this is the output and it's in zero, which is the base of the PLC and it's output zero. So now let me just add a brand. Actually, no, let me make another rung because I'm going to delete this out. Just add another rung down and we're going to put an output in. Was it an IA8? Nope, that was an IA8. So we want an input. And now let's just start typing I colon, but this time I'm going to put one and I'm going to hit enter. Don't worry about a description on that. In fact, I'm just going to copy then paste this down. Put that over here and now I'm going to hit the verify button. And so now this one says 1762 IA. So that tells me what module this input is connected to. So that's what that means, Warren. Hope that helps that out. Okay, let's see. Where are we at? Leland. Leland, let me uh, let me get back to you as um on that one shot. But okay, I'm gonna delete this back out. Warren to let me know if that um doesn't clear up that. And let's go back over here. So all right, we have our tags here, and so now we have input. We figured that out, and we know we have 16 inputs on this PLC. So we have fault and we have data. So data is the actual input data. I don't know how to state that without using the word data. You got anything for me, Amber? No. <laughs> Thanks for the help. Yeah. Okay. And so then we have zero through 15. And so these are the physical inputs. And in fact, no, let's go ahead and get through this and then we'll download this and look at a few things. But all right, over here, we want this to be input number one, the same as we we're over there. So we want to, you know, we, we think we need that crazy local thing. Well, if you'll double click here, you actually get a drop down. And if we click it, then we can navigate through here. And so we have local and then we know it's one colon I. I'm going to open that up and then we're going to have data. And yeah, there's point number zero. This is going to be input zero. Now, again, we're going to put a description on that. And one thing I love about Studio 5000, because I'll probably use these for the rest of it, is, you know, we right-click, we get lots of options. So I tell everybody all the time, if you're not sure how to do something, right-click and see what options come up. And we're going to edit the main operand description. But Studio 5000, every time there is a shortcut code, they put it right here. So from now on, I can just hit Control-D and do a, do a description. And so this is going to be switch 1. And then we're going to need an output. Oops, I already had an output. And this is going to be, oops, I don't know. See, there I go shortcutting because I know, you know, and it, I almost never use these drop downs, but they're great when you're trying to find it and start out. But you notice we can click here and we can navigate through this one. But also, okay, we know it's local. Let me get that back out of there. So instead of using that drop down, I can hit the L for local and then O. And notice it starts filling everything in. Now I want local colon one colon O, so I can backspace and hit O, and then I can hit the dot and I'm gonna get what options are. So we have data dot zero. So this is gonna be output zero. While I didn't wire it to a light, I am gonna hit control D 
and then I'm going to put light one. All right, so this is really basic, and we're going to actually let's add a second one because we're going to go over the three basic instructions. So we're going to add another wrong. Actually, no, let's just make this real easy. We're going to copy and paste because we're lazy. We don't like to do a lot of work. And in this case, I want this second instruction here. So I'm going to drop that down. And I don't want to type all this again. So I can click this address because this is what I want to look at. I can drag it right there. There you go. Without typing anything, I have that instruction now. And then here, we're going to look at output number one. We're going to turn output number one on. And so this is, and honestly, this is the basic instructions that probably make up, I don't know, 50, 60, 60% of all programs. So now I am going to download this, and I'm going to go step by step through downloading, because usually here's where I tell you, if you, <laughs> if you need any help with it, just go look at the rest of our lessons. So we're going to go to communications. And I don't care that this who active, I mean, this download button's here. In fact, here's a good example. I'm going to hit download. And we're going to get this failed to communications. And it does say communications path needed, but it doesn't clearly tell you that. And that's why I always like going to communications who active. Because this is going to let me set my path. And I still have my button options here. And then I'm going to navigate to my PLC, which is on Ethernet. And... We are going to use this one right here that right now is 161 and it's Monday blank. So I'm going to download this. And we are going to pay attention to this prompt when I hit this. I'm going to hit the download button. And again, I can't stress enough. I know there's a lot of words on this page, but really download offline project live stream 928 to the controller. And it tells you this controller right now is called Monday blank. So make sure you know that this is what you want to do. Because but once we overwrite Monday blank that's in this PLC, there is no turning back. So I'm going to hit the download button. We're going to get there, Yubi. So let me hit through a couple basic things here. Okay. So now, the, here is a basic PLC program. And I don't know, you know, I should have thought about the screen focus. Probably should have wired a couple of lights. But yeah, you probably can kind of see. Output 1's on right now. And I switch input 0. Yeah, and you can see that. You can see the lights kind of changing. Don't worry, we're going to go through them on the screen here. But all right. This right here, and you know, I hear so many things for this. And I mean, if you come into my class and you call this a normally open... I do scream at you usually, and this is not a normally closed. If you'll call them anything but that, I'm usually pretty happy. But normally open and normally closed are electrical terms. They are not programming terms. And so what I always say on this is this instruction, which is this shape right here, goes and looks for a one. Does it have one? Well, if we mouse over, we can put a quick value. No, it has a zero. So this one is false. It's going to pass false conditions on to this output energized. And a false output energized does something. Don't tell me it does nothing. A false energized goes right to zero. Where to? Output zero. And then this instruction that looks terribly like a normally closed, it's a go look for a zero. Where at? At this local blah, blah, blah thing, which we've already determined is input zero. Does it have one? Yes. Yeah. So it's true. And while we're, we'll talk in some other videos about that the green on the screen is not always true, but it is represented there as true. And then this is going to be true, and a true output energized goes and writes a 1. So right now, output 0 is off, output 1 is on. I switch on output 1, and I'm sorry, input 0, do that again. I switch on input 0, and now this top rung is true. It's going to write a 1 to output 0, and now output 1 is off. Now, we have lots of videos on this, and I, I, we can come back and talk about this more. I'm going to hit the UV stand because this is a little bit confusing. Is now what we want to do is this was a lot to remember. And so what we want to do is we're going to, yeah, we're going to make a start-stop with output 2. So 1... We're going to do this edit online. 
So I am going to bring down another rung. And we can do this right online. You can see there, it's got red there. And we have lowercase i's right here. And I tell everybody, if it's lowercase, it's not a big deal. Well, actually, yeah, let's put some stuff in here. Then we'll talk about that. But we're going to make a basic start-stop circuit. So I've done this in many videos. And so I'm not going to talk deeply through this because right now we really want to hit base tags and alias tags. Is This is just the basic start-stop circuit. That's the structure of it. So this is typically start, this is stop, this is your output or your motor. And we need to remember or write all this craziness here. And I don't want to do that. I want to, you know, I want to make a tag that's called start because that's the advantage of Studio 5000. Whereas over here in 500, we have this structure. We can, we can use N7 colon zero, we can use this B3 slash zero slash 10. In Studio 5000, we can make our tags names. We can make them as memorable as our controller name. So I'm gonna make a tag called start. And then actually I'm gonna make a tag here. We're gonna call it stop. And just so we can not get too lost on this, I'm gonna leave this as a base tag of the output. So in this case, I'm gonna make it output two. And just, I know I can drag that down, but just so we can review here, I'm going to be looking at local colon one colon O for output. I'm going to open it up and there's data and then zero. Now, one thing I didn't talk about there, let me do that again. Because I see some people get stuck here is if we go to local colon O. They click here and they're like, well, that's all I can do. And they'll, they'll double click that and they're like, well, now I got a red, I got an error, I can't figure it out. So what I tell everybody is if you see an arrow like this, click it because there's something underneath it. And now we can see our data. And then as soon as we clicked it, there's an arrow. So a lot of navigating Studio 5000 is figuring out where these arrows are at and when to click them. But okay, now since we can drag it, we're gonna make that exactly the same. But okay, we got red because you remember I just typed start and I just typed stop. And I'm gonna hit the verify button just so we get our errors up here and see it. Hit the verify and it says wrong to XIC operand zero reference tag is undefined. Now just to show you this, I'm gonna click way up here on wrong zeros output. And then I'm gonna click, oops, then I'm gonna click this first error. It highlights that for you. So there's no hunting, there's no scrolling. That's, you know, that's, you know, as far as learning to troubleshoot machines, if you learn never to use your scroll wheel, you're, you'll be really fast. <laughs> but it's learning, you know, the little tools to get to places fast. But right, we need to create this because it is just a tag right now. So I'm going to right click it and we're going to have a new tag called start. I click there. And then this is what we would normally do. And this is what UV is asking about is this base right here is this would be a base tag this is how it normally is done in fact let me just create another tag let's call this start base i'm going to delete this but just so we see what we normally do start base and we click the create button and so what we have done if we go back to our controller tags and let's close that up is now we have a tag in addition to our local things here that we now have our inputs and outputs we now have start base, and this is going to be just a box, a one or a zero box that we can use somewhere. It's not connected to an input. It's not connected to an output. It's just a basic box. So we can't really do anything with it except for store a one or a zero. But then what UV is asking about is we also have, now one thing, I just did something that I haven't talked about yet. You know, I double clicked over here over my controller tags. As we open things, they make ta they make tabs up here, so I can bounce back and forth between these without having to go over here and navigate and find all my craziness again. Because while this is really easy with one main routine, you know, programs get really complicated. Right, I'll take a drink of water. Give me just a second. Oh, things looking over there, Amber. Look great. Look great. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, so we're going to go back to here, and I'm going to take that base back off of it, because that was just an example. We need a start tag, but 
we want it to be connected to one of these crazy input things. So I'm going to right click it, new start. And then instead of a base tag, we're going to make it an alias tag. And what that means is, is this tag is an assumed name. I mean, if it's, you know, it's Billy the Kid for William H. Bonnie or whatever his real name was. Do we even know what his real name was? Uh, no. uh, you get what I mean. I mean, it's a name that maybe you don't go by. Or even in my case, I mean, my name's Timothy, but nobody calls me that. I, you know, I have an alias of Tim, I guess you could say. So what is this an alias for? So now we need to go navigate and find our complicated name that we don't want to type every time. And that's going to be input six in this case. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to go to my data. Now I did that fast. Let me do it again. As I click here, because you know, I know I want an input. And every time we see an arrow, we click on it. And then we get to data. And once we click on it, we see another arrow. And we see it, we click on it. And we want input number six. So that is going to make start an alias for input six. So I'm going to create that. And now you notice this looks a little different than the one below it. So here, in fact, let me get off of that. Yeah, come on now. The dark black that you see in Studio 5000, that's your tag name. Anything that you see is gray, it is some type of other information. So in this case, switch one is a description. In this case, it's telling you that, hey, my base tag is local colon one colon I data six. So now we're gonna do the exact same thing for stop. We're gonna right click it, new stop. And then we're going to go and make it input seven. Oops, first we gotta make it an alias. And so then we're gonna go and we're gonna click on I colon one colon, I mean local colon one colon I. And since there's an arrow, we're gonna click on it. There's our data. And then we're gonna find number seven. Okay, let me catch up on chat really quick here. Let's see. Okay, you'll be up. We're hopefully hitting your base of alias now. Andrew, glad you think this is great. Welcome. And what do you think about mapping your inputs and outputs instead of aliasing? You know, I will be honest with you. <laughs> I'm sitting here showing you how to do aliasing. I rarely do it. And mainly because, one, that's why we have descriptions. And if I'm troubleshooting this, it's really clear to me that this is local colon one colon i dot data dot zero. And this is where I need to go look. And when you map them, you make another layer that I've got to go look at. So I really discourage people from doing that. Um, there are some exceptions to that, but on your run of the mill machine, nah, we don't need it. But okay, we got that. Now let's talk a little bit about online edits while we're doing it is Notice that right now we have lowercase i's because the next thing I see people do all the time after that is I just put that in and now they're like, okay, well, local six, it's not working. What's wrong? Well, that lowercase i means, hey, this is just something that you're doing in your PC. This is not a big deal. You can scribble all you want in your PC. You're not actually messing with the PLC here. So now we need to take that edit and we need to get it into the PLC here. Now there's a couple ways to do it. Is first we have this finalize all button. And even in when people are in my training, I don't let them use this button until they can understand what the others do. Because you can really mess some things up royally with this button right here. So first we have this one right here and that says accept pending wrong edits. And what that means is take the program edits that you have just made and put them into the PLC, but don't run them. And we can see that when we go to do this, is we're going to hit this button and then pay attention to these eyes when we do it. So we're gonna hit that. And now they're capitalized. And I always tell everybody, you know, if you've ever gotten an email from your boss and like there's a sentence or a section that everything's capitalized like they're screaming at you, that's usually something they're serious about. So now that it's capitalized, it's serious. It's in this PLC. Now it's not running yet. And if we look here, we have these green bars right here and we can see the green bars going through here and then they stop right here. And that means that this is not running right now. So the next button we have is this test button or test accepted program edits. And that means test to try out, <coughs> excuse me. 
And so when I click it, then what? pay attention to our green right here. Now, this wrong is being tested in the PLC. So it is running. And now if we click input number six, we're going to see, hopefully you can see output number two, it comes on. And also, even in our program now, we have an indication that output two is now on. So, and too many times I see programs that look exactly like this. It, do not leave your program like this. <laughs> People do. They're like, well, I think that works. Let me come back later. Now, you need to make a decision now. Does this work or do we want to back out? And really, if you're not, if you're sure it's going to work, then we need to hit this assemble button. Now, the assemble button means make all this stuff permanent, delete anything we're not using now, and voila. Now we have no letters by it. Now the finalize button, just so we can see that, we start an edit. Now when we start an edit, you notice we get a second copy of it. And I have people all the time, they're like clicking down here. They're like, I can't get anything to change. Well, that's because this is the rung that you're editing. This is the rung that is running. And so this finalize button, what it does is it automates the steps of accepting, testing, and assembling into one button. This is a very dangerous button. You better know for sure you want this because there's no undo button to hitting that finalize button. And you saw there for a split second, you could see it run through the different steps, but that's insanely fast. But okay, UV, so now we have start, stop. We have still have local six, local seven, and we have output two. And so now let's go back to our controller tags. In fact, we haven't talked about this yet is you can right click any tag. And I struggle with some people on this because we got to understand what the tag is. The tag is the black area. So if I right click switch one, this is the menu I get right here. If I right click local, this is the menu I get. And same down here, if I right click start, this is the menu I get. But yeah, if I right click the instruction, this is the menu I get. So this is an instruction, actually go up here to switch one. This is an instruction, this is a tag, this is a description. And they give you different options when you right click them. But I wanna go look at the controller tags of start and I don't wanna do a bunch of scrolling. So we're going to right click start and we are gonna monitor it. And that's gonna actually, well, you can't see me point. Um, get off of the head. And what that's going to do is that's going to take us to this controller tags tab and it's going to take us right to the start. All right, so now we actually have a start tag and we have a stop tag. So in this case of switch, I'm sorry, in the case of switch one, notice we didn't get a switch one tag actually. But in the start case, we actually get a tag down here. So let me open this up so we can see our inputs. And so for input one, we have a description of switch one here. But you notice six and seven don't have input. Down here though, we have a start tag and a stop tag. And so one thing that can be a little confusing when you're looking at this is, okay, how do I know what exactly these are. Well, one, we can always right click it and go to the tag properties and we'll see there, okay, this is an alias for that. Also over here on the edit tag, I guess they do this, I think Rockwell does this mainly to um, thin down the columns here. You notice we actually have two down here. We have our monitor and we have in our editor. And so in this case, we don't have that origin column. But if we go to the edit tags, we can see this is an alias for local six. This is an alias for local seven. But okay, let's pay attention. Whoops, wrong one. Let's pay attention to the values that are in these right now. So right now, in fact, let me turn them off. Let's go and look here. Is one of all my switches are off right now. Whoops. All my switches are off right now. And if you notice though, input seven is on. And the reason for that is input seven is a normally closed switch, just so we have a normally closed switch to talk about on this. And 
if we go over here and we look at our tags, our stop tag, which is that normally close, has a one in it now. And the stop tag has a zero in it. And so I'm going to switch input six on. Now we can see input six right here. We can see its value and we can see our start value, both at the same time. And when I switch them, notice they both come on. And same with the stop. If I switch it on, which is going to make this a zero, if you pay attention to seven and you pay attention to our stop tag, then they both go to zero. All right, Yubi, does that help you um, understand the base tags versus the alias tags? Any questions on that? You know, that's a that's an awesome question. And you know, part part of this, I've got a video coming out on this thing. I'm glad you all asked that question. Is one of the struggles with converting from RS Logic 500 to Studio 5000 is yeah, trying to find these. And honestly, I think Rockwell may well, and again, you know, it's all about time. This was all designed in the 80s. But people look at this B3 slash zero and they're like, yeah, here's my bits. Let's open up B3 and then let's open up N7. These look tremendously different right here. Because yeah, we have B3 zero. We have 16 bits, zero through 15. We have N7 here and we only have one value. But one thing while you're in there, and this would be good to do, Daryl, is open up Studio 5000. And notice we have a radix here. This is what we call in, well, know, let's go over to Studio 5000 and look. Make sure I get this right. Uh, this is what we call the style in Studio 5000. But this is, I call it the view. So right now, B3, it defaults to a binary view. And N7 defaults to a decimal view. Switch the radix on an N7 to binary. And you're going to see, in fact, let's just, can I skinny this up? Well, okay, here, I can stop that right over top of that. Now these things line up perfectly. So at B3 colon zero, now I didn't say slash zero, B3 colon zero is a 16-bit integer. A, a N7 colon zero is also a 16-bit integer. Now, I guess to help people understand, maybe maybe to el eliminate anybody having to understand bullying, bullying, bullying. Um, <laughs> man, it's time for a drink. Hold on. <laughs> so to keep people from having to understand bits and integers and booleans and all those things, they made this B3 and N7, they're actually identical. They are the same things. So if we, in fact, now, you know, before, let me switch this back just so we don't get confused. When we clicked on this, this was N7 colon zero. And, you know, I'm gonna click on this one. This is B3 colon zero slash zero. And what that means is B3 slash B3 colon zero, which is an integer. And I want bit zero of it. And we don't have that option down here. But when we switch that radix, notice we got that slash zero now. So this is how you specify which bit in an integer you want. That's what that slash means. But okay, now we kind of have a handle on, okay, that apparently a B3 and an N7 are kind of the same thing. Well, what are they in Studio 5000? So we'll go over here and Actually, yeah, let's just do all this right in our controller tag. Why not? Oops, I got to focus. There we go. Let's right click the controller tags and we're going to create a new tag. And so this one I'm just going to call my int. And it's one thing I'll tell you that I really cringe over don't create a tag that is called n7. Like, Daryl, please don't do that. Or b3. That is not a Studio 5000 tag. I mean, and I'm saying my int just because we're talking about an int, but I mean, this should be the, I don't know, the, the set point of something. I mean, make these tags as descriptive as possible. But all right, we're going to create my int. And then the data type here, we're going to make it an int. So I'm just going to make that an int, and we're going to create it. 
And let me close these back up. All right, and now we have my int. So this is an integer tag. The same, and then here's where it, I think people get stumped. This is an integer tag, the same as n colon zero is an integer tag, or b3 colon zero is an integer tag. And so we go over here, if we were trying to, you know, switch some native thing over, then if I go and I want to address something in my program, and I'm going to bring down another wrong, and yeah, let's just do the exact same thing we've been doing. So we're just going to break that, bring it up those, yeah, but I'm just going to make this output three. Why not? So we can see that, yeah, you don't, inputs don't have to dumb control inputs. You can actually have internal things, control inputs, outputs, all that. But okay, now we have my int. So I'm going to double click on this and I'm going to go find my int. Now remember, when you click on something, you see one of these arrow boxes. That means you can click on it and get more info. Here are those 16 bits the same as you had these 16 bits under B3 or if our radix and binary on N7 we had through here. So B3 colon zero would be my int, oops, lost my focus, my int dot zero. So this is the bit tag of that. Now, typically I would not do this unless um, we were manipulating that as an integer because we also have Boolean tags. And so we're gonna go back to the controller tags. And this time, just so we can do it a different way, we're gonna go to edit tags. And this time I'm gonna make my bool. And then for our data type, we are gonna have a bool. All right. So now let's go back to monitor and let's just focus on these two for a little bit. So my bull's value right now is zero. My int's value is zero. And I can make my bull a one. I can also make my int a one. And now's where they start to vary is, okay, I put a two into my bull. It's gonna say invalid or value string invalid. And what that means is I've gone out of the range that I can put into my bull because they can only be ones and zeros. Whereas my int, it'll take a two, it'll take a 20, it'll take a 200, it'll take a 2000, it'll take a 20,000, but okay, one, two, three, four, five, it will not take 200,000. See here, now it says value string, or value string invalid again. And that's because this value that I'm trying to enter is way too large. So let's see if we can understand a little bit about what's going on here. I'm gonna escape out of that. So now we have crazy. Let's, let's go back to zero on this, just so we can see. And then notice we have an arrow. And boy, if you're ever gonna have a class, everybody's like, if you have an arrow, what do you do? Click it. <laughs> so inside here, we have 15 bits, just like we had in RS Logics 500. And so now let me make the value of this one. And you see, we're gonna have a one there. And then let's see, what did I do after that? I did two. Whoops, well, there's 22. We don't, we don't wanna go there. Well, mainly as we change these, see how they're actually filling these in with different numbers? Oops, I went too high. I put one too many decimals. But so this is how this actually stores a value. Now, what do all these values mean? Well, let's put in a value of minus one just so we can see this. So minus one, that means all these values are now one. And if we put zero, they're gonna all be zeros. Now, the bits you need to be, or the two values you need to know about is one is if we put a one in bit 15, that's gonna give us actually our maximum negative number. So this integer can go from negative 32,768 and actually, just so I don't have to click a bunch of ones, it can go to 32,767. And if you notice, those are all ones now that suffer that last one. But so my, so my int can store a number from negative 32,768 to positive 32,767. And my bull can only store a one or a zero. Okay, Daryl, I know I know we were emailed even a little bit before. Does that kind of help clear up the bull versus the dent? Or mainly, yeah, I think and I think the stumbling block for everybody is realizing that B3 is not a Boolean value. B3 is an integer. 
B3 colon 0 slash 0, that's a Boolean value. So, I mean, in here, let's just throw some things in here to make this easier. Um, let's see, this was our run. And may, uh, maybe this is, I don't know, pause, just something I haven't used. So typically in RS Logics 500, we need our descriptions, and that's how we would track what these are. But in Studio 5000, I would never make my int and make dot one the run and zero the pause. I would come over here, and I would make a run tag. And since that's only a one or a zero or a bit, then I would make it a bool. And then same with the pause. It would be a bull. That way we have these tags that we'll be tracking when we're running and when we're pausing or whatever we're tracking. Okay, there. Good. That got you. Let's see. Let me catch up a little bit on chat. Yeah, there are some questions in here. I'll see where this goes from here. Um, I know. I know. And... <laughs> Okay, let's see. I would normally no. I mean, Andrew, and you know, here's where you know everybody has their different ways of programming. But you know, from a troubleshooting standpoint, I absolutely would not map my inputs and outputs like that. That really um it adds a layer of really kind of pain. <laughs> that's a, yeah, but that's an opinion. Um, and I don't get into function block versus ladder because you know we have a PLC quiz series going on right now, and in that, that's one of my challenges. Is that I'm um I'm programming them in all three each quiz I have a, well I have switch four I got to flip around right now but yeah in switch four to the left I program it in ladder the middle it's function block and the right is structured text and there's kind of my one versus the other well let's do it in all and because what I find most of the time is people don't like what they don't understand as much as anything I mean really I think in the end we found that um at least most programs seem to run about the same in any of them. Let's see, what else do we have here? Okay, well, you know, one, um, what other questions do we have then? Because really we've covered the communication. This is supposed to be the basics. So we've covered communicating over USB, RS-230, I mean, USB, serial, and um, what was the other one, Amber? Mm. Ethernet. <laughs> the one that we're actually using. And we've talked about the differences between factory talk links. Oops. Where's my thing? Come on now. Oh, why does my computer want to glitch out now? Must be tired. But yeah, we talked about the difference between factory talk links and RS links. Yeah, any more questions on that? I know some of you came in later, but yeah. For the most part, if you are doing Ethernet or USB, use the new factory talk links. If you are doing serial or any of the other ones, then use RS links. Besides the fact, yeah, apparently factory talk links takes longer to boot up because we're still booting on that. There we go. Anybody if they have any questions after the chat, they are more than welcome to email us. Yeah, absolutely. You can throw them down in the comments. You can go to twcontrols.com um, and ask any questions that come up after this. And yeah, we'll probably make this live stream available later because it didn't go. It definitely didn't go as bad as the one with the power outage. That was very um, <laughs> that was very eventful. But yeah, so yeah, in back to factory talk links because this is a new one, and honestly, this is one I'm trying to really start to use and come to grips and find all the little things about. Is if you're doing Ethernet or you're doing USB, use factory talk links. If you're using mainly just this DF1, in fact, let me go ahead. And before I forget, let me delete out my Ethernet IP. Yeah, if you're doing serial or actually let me go back there, if you're doing serial or if you're doing any of these other protocols, then you probably still need to use RS links. Let's see. Show us how some of the instructions work like a move. Do you mean like the move instruction, the MOV? Is that what you're talking about? Um, well, okay, we have my int now, and we can create, well, one, well, just so we can learn a little bit about, you can do different values of different ones. Let's go ahead and create my dim. We didn't talk about that. This is really the default data type of Studio 5000. In fact, you see when I start clicking, I mean, when I start typing, 
it comes up with a dent here. So this is the default. And then, yeah, uh, we can go over here. Um, what were we doing here? Oh, we don't need that anymore. And let's just bring down a move instruction. And so we haven't talked, there are categories up here for the different types. So that's timer counter and everything. And there is a problem. I hope somebody can show me in chat. If you notice when I started clicking there, did you see that these had their descriptions completely out? And when I click on one of them, it truncates them. Because I was getting ready to say the move one would be on the move logical. And as I was saying that, it went to this whole move slash L dot dot dot. So I got to figure that happened in our last upgrade. I got to figure out what happened there. But yeah, so we're going to bring down a move instruction. And I'll delete that out. And yeah, so just to show that we can move between different data types, I'm going to move my int, which has a 32767, to my dent, which right now has zero. But notice this, if I mouse over it, you can learn a lot. The data type of this one is int. The data type of this one is dent, or double integer. So this has twice the number of bits in it. This is a 32-bit number. This is a 16-bit number. Okay, and just so we can go over again, I'm not going to use the finalize all button. So we're going to hit the accept button, and that's going to send it to the PLC. And like I always say, everybody, if it's lowercase, it's not a big deal. But when it gets capitalized, like your boss, you know, when you get something capital, it usually means he means some serious business. So we hit that. It's capitalized now. And then we're going to go over here. We're going to test. And when we test, we're going to see these green bars come down it. And also, you'll see that value went to 32,767 now. And then, like I said, when you're done testing, you either take your edit out or go ahead and finalize it. I mean, assemble it. So we'll have that. But okay, so now we've moved this value to this value. Now I can, I can change this one to a 6. That one's going to change to 6, whatever it is. But, you know, it's worth taking a moment to look into these bits, especially when we're at 32,767. So I'm going to go over here. And we're going to open up, whoops, go to monitor tag. That out of the way. And we're going to open up my dent. And we can see we got a bunch of ones there. And if we scroll on down here, you see all of them are zero, but we have ones from 14 through zero. Now I'm going to open up my int. And same deal. We have numbers from 1 through 14. So it's doing the exact, it's putting the exact same numbers in here to get the exact same number in the end result here. Now, no, we're not going binary on this one. But, <laughs> but yeah, so does that answer your question there? Does that kind of show you how a move, um, a move instruction works to move data from one place to another? Because, yeah, I think we're about ready to wind this down if nobody has any questions. Is it really that? That was my goal here. Y'all wanted something. What? Amber says I need to come full screen now. I don't know that they would call my face lovely, but okay. We are now full screen. And <laughs> we have gone, we've talked a little bit about different PLCs. We've talked about software, you know, so. You, and again, there are a lot of different softwares even in Allen Bradley that I didn't mention, but the, the major ones that you're going to run into are RSLogix 500 and then Studio 5000 and Connected Components Workbench. So knowing which one you need for which PLC. Ooh, I did miss one thing. Not all versions of a particular PLC software have the same capabilities. So in the case of this, and this is the one that I get it on, in fact, yeah, this PLC right here, is somebody has a Micrologix 1400 PLC and they need to connect to it. And they find my video on how to download RSLogix MicroStarter Lite. And MicroStarter Lite is for the Micrologix 1000 and Micrologix 1100. It does not do the 1400 or the Slick or the 1500. And so, Make sure you know not only yeah you know, which one you need, but which exact version. Same with this. You know, I, I talk a lot of people into going with Micro, with Studio 5000 Mini Edition or Light Edition. 
because both of those are much more economical to get you started, but they only do the compact logics. Well, if you're only running in the compact logics, then that's a very good economical decision. Now, just to trip you up really a lot is the Connected Components Workbench does all of the PLCs that are available to it, whether you buy it or not. The biggest thing missing from it is online edits. I think there are a few other things, but uh, it, the free version of it does most of those things. But all right, I do believe that we are about at the end of this live stream because, yeah, we've covered software, we've covered cabling, we've covered configuring factory talk links and configuring RS link, I mean, RS links classic. And also, I'm getting tongue tied, which probably means that, yeah, it's about done. I'm thirsty, I'm hungry. Amber's over there, like, yeah, when are we going to lunch? <laughs> <laughs> so I do appreciate y'all's participation and yeah, put in the comments, what do you want the next live stream to be on? Till next time. Hi, this is Tim. And this is Amber with TW Controls. Hey, thanks for finding our channel. Here's a playlist with some similar videos. And YouTube thinks you'll like these. When you're ready for some intense training, check out our PLC lab. And if our videos have helped you out, but you're not using our products, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Till next time. See ya.